Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Paola and today I'm here with the incredible Liam <laughs> Rivera. She is the author of Never Look Back, which is a retelling of the Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. So Lilian, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about the book? Sure, um, I have it here. <laughs> I, I forgot to take it out. Anyway, so uh, yes, it's uh, Never Look Back. It's um, uh, Orpheus and Eurydice retelling set in the, in the Bronx, New York, where I'm originally from. And the novel, the young adult novel has um, <laughs> or, or Orpheus. He's a bachata, uh, wannabe bachata singer who meets and falls in love with Yuri, who is originally from Puerto Rico and is displaced from Hurricane Maria and is also being followed by an angry spirit named Atho. And, um, and so, you know, as the Greek myth uh, is, uh, is known for, you know, they travel to the underworld and they hope that their love will be able to overcome whatever it is that they have to overcome. It's told in al alternating points of view. And I had a really great time uh, writing it. It was a lot of it was a lot of fun, and it's, it's you know it's heavy and it has a lot of adventure and it's full of drama and um, but it's also full of hope and love and 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 music. It is a fantastic and very like a hard hitting contemporary. So, well, not necessarily contemporary. It's like a mix of contemporary and mythology. It's fantastic. So no problem. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so what inspired you to write this novel? Um, I really love the, um, the Greek myth. I was really young when I first saw this movie called Black Orpheus. And it's a retelling uh, of the myth, but it's set in, in Brazil during um, Carnaval. And so I loved that movie. I loved it. And so that was my first introduction to the myth. And I've, I've loved it for so many years. And I thought, what, how, can I, how can I write that myth? Um, retell it in a different way that'll be exciting for me and, and just bring it back and, and introduce it to new readers. And so, um, so yeah, so that was really the inspiration was Black Orpheus. And, um, and I just wanted to try to find a way of writing about um, Hurricane Maria and Puerto Rico and, Dominic and Dominican culture and the Caribbean culture in general and find a way of, of really kind of celebrating that, th those worlds and, and also just write about big themes like, I don't know, colonization and, um, and things that, you know, that is happening right now. So uh, finding ways of including like you said like a mixture of mad of magical kind of magical realism or fabulous um elements and also contemporary uh themes and it's done in such an interesting way in a way that i wasn't even really expecting because i don't know i wonder how you started it with did you start with the like, retelling and then recreated the characters based on fuse and uh Eurydice, or did you Think of the characters first and then you thought huh this myth applies to them perfectly i was definitely thinking about the myth and mm -hmm. i wanted this i needed the structure of the story so that was the structure for me was being able to have this is the story you know i read the various versions of the story and um and and so i kept on studying it and but i also knew that i was going to you know, make sure that I write about um, Hurricane Maria because that was what was on my mind during those, you know, the past five years. And, um, and I wanted to find a way of writing about something that I was, that was filling me with such despair and anxiety because it was affecting my family or mm -hmm. it has affected my family. And um, how did I, how can I write about such, you know, such deep sorrow? You know, my way of coping with anything is through writing. So, um, so that was really my way of, of um, you know, of capturing that a, a story, a story about, about it and, and, and figure out a way of putting it in this myth, you know. So the myth was first and then the characters came in. <laughs> That's such an interesting thing because I think, well, I don't know how it works with retellings. I'm definitely not creative enough to like 
give them the spin that they need to be like this is completely unexpected which is something that happened while i was reading um never look back so mm -hmm. um i was wondering how you approached uh, the the myth and gave it like its feminist twist to it like how did you just completely turn it on its head because it doesn't even have like greek names aside from uh, a few yeah i try to you know it's always like a way of nodding towards the original text or whatever the original is because it's been retold so many times so there's different versions um besides the greek version you know there's different versions of it but um i really was trying to think of a way that for it to make sense for present time and also you know to still um to still look at it at the mythology of it and incorporate the ones that the incorporate aspects of it that made sense to me and um and still push the the book forward or push the action forward the plot forward um you know everyone has really strong uh, opinions about orpheus and what he does or doesn't do <laughs> no spoilers but um you know so i just wanted to to really try to understand this that idea of uh, which is an idea that comes from so much there's like, like this idea of a man of a boy a young boy saving the life of a young girl and um and that's just a story across you know time you know starting with the orpheus myth if you read the the original myth it's nothing works out for anybody <laughs> it's tragedy all over <laughs> no one wins so um, I wanted to just think about what that looks like for young people, especially young uh, Latinos or Afro-Latinos who are these two characters. And what does that look like in the present time and, and in this kind of fabulous world that I created? So it was, it was a challenge, but it was a good challenge to have. <laughs> I bet, I bet. And how did you manage to like transmit those feelings that like such intense feelings of like love mm -hmm. and, and everything that's going on in our characters minds concerning like the stigma i needed i needed love <laughs> at that moment i personally mm -hmm. i was feeling really um down about the way things are and you know i still do i still am feeling down but um i was really searching for hope through these characters honestly so it was this idea, you know, as as Yuri, Yuri, the character Yuri is a, a character who is going through, mm -hmm. suffering through PTSD, suffering through going through, through this huge uh, moment, you know, the Hurricane Maria, and and I was, you know, and I I kept thinking about Latinas and and their, you know, and all these kind of really old sentiments of what it looks like to get professional help you know mm -hmm. when you're suffering through kind of these mental um sufferings and so i really wanted to write about this that idea and to really kind of push this notion that you know, professional mental health is not um is something that we can all use and i'm mm -hmm. a huge a huge advocate for it my for myself and mm -hmm. um for anyone so you know whatever that looks like you know it doesn't you know it, you, we could shape it the way it doesn't have to be um how we've imagined imagined it for so many years so or maybe our parents have you know because it's not something that that people want you know you don't do that <laughs> you don't tell your, <laughs> yeah. your story no. your, your problems sorry you don't tell your problems to anyone you know you, mm. you keep it to yourself or you to your family and or you to your god or whatever that is and so I just wanted to open that for discussion and just uh -huh. sort of push push that push those ideas and sort of like let's talk about this the stigma behind um finding looking for you know mental health and using mental health therapies and you know let's let's talk about it openly you know um so that was really something that came up in the story mm -hmm. which I didn't know that was going to happen but it came out um on that same note I wanted to pull a quote from something that you wrote for the Washington Post called uh, What Puerto Rico's Protesters Can Teach the Rest of Us. 
Yeah, it was an opinion piece that they asked me to write. Yeah. So it says, uh, the Puerto Rican revolutionary Pedro Albizu Campos once said, young people have a duty to defend their country with weapons of knowledge. I can't imagine a quote more suitable to capturing this moment. This is the generación del yo no me dejo, the I will not allow it generation. The young in Puerto Rico are showing the rest of America how to do it. And I think that you've incorporated that same sentiment in your books. And how do you think it um, particularly applies for Never Look Back? For Never Look Back, I was really um, grappling with this idea of those, the believers and non-believers. You know, you have one side, which is like fierce, who believes in he, you know, he can sing and he knows he has the power to, you know, seduce and lure, young, you know, other girls. And because he has this gift of, you know, of being a beautiful singer. And, um, but he doesn't believe in it. Mm -mm. He believes that, he doesn't believe that there's a future, you know, mm -hmm. in it. And so then with Yuri, Yuri is a believer because she's forced to be a believer. You know, she's encountering things that are out of this world, you know, that out of contemporary world. And so they meet and that's the clash, right? Of a person who's a believer and a non-believer. I don't know how, what is that? That really is, I feel this, I, that fuels this idea of protest and mm -hmm. uprising and what's currently happening right now. You know, either you're a believer that the pandemic is real <laughs> or that police brutality exists, you know, mm -hmm. or you, or you don't, <laughs> you know, so there's just like this. And for me, if you look, if you look at all the people who are uprising, it's all young people, it's all mm -hmm. young people. So that to me gives me so much hope. And um, so when I'm writing these stories, I'm writing about young people who may be, maybe they're not seeing things for the first time or maybe they're just opening their eyes for the first time and i feel like with fierce it's like a slow reveal you know revelation um that he's you know some people are they're just blinded and they want to stay like this and um fierce is is um forced to open his eyes to see mm -hmm. to see the world around him and the world is not exactly what he thinks it it really is about how someone can come into our lives and completely just change it for better or for worse. In this one, I think it's mostly for the better, but mm -hmm. uh, Yuri has other things that came into her life that changed it for um, the worse. In, in another article that you wrote about um, Esmeralda Santiago's memoirs, you mentioned that she, she talked about the relationship that she had with her mother. She talks about how she sort of breaks free from her uh, mother's protective rules. Mm -hmm. And I think that rings true to your, to your novels as well. And in this one, I thought it was very interesting how we explored two different people with two very like different parents who, who received different styles of education. So how do you open that window into understanding those complicated parent-children relationships? And how do you think that Fuse and Yuri are like working on dissecting that internalized learning that they got? Yeah, um, that's such a good question. You know, with both um, with both Yuri and Fierce, they're coming from a family, they're coming from parents who are separated. Mm -hmm. and and with that comes different kind of struggles. Um, but they're, they are, they have very different struggles, right? I, they both come from very loving families. Um, but uh, Fierce, is, his mother has a very, has a very uh, strict idea of where he's going or where his path is going to lead him. And, um, and his father is trying to push him more towards his gift. Mm -hmm. And then with Yudi, Yudi is, you know, the, his, her father left when she was young and you'll know that in the first the second chapter when you read that um so she doesn't have a relationship with her father and her mom is just trying to maintain yeah. <laughs> trying to raise her daughter as much as she can and protect her as much as she can and at, in the midst of all these things that are happening so they both are struggling both and just trying to you know, it's that moment when you're in young and, and when you're at that age and you're almost on the verge of being an adult 
that you're really sort of seeing your parents in a, in a new light, in a different light and trying to, and it is just trying to state your claim to your own space. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's really where you see both of them, you know, they're trying to just figure out their own path is what they're really trying to do. And, um, and it's exciting because they're both, they're both at that moment. They meet at, right at that moment where they're both like, oh, I think I thought I was going to go this way, but honestly, they're going to have to go a whole different way. <laughs> so it's really cool to see, you know, you follow their journey. Yeah. And it's a very interesting way of showing it because men and women, unfortunately, have like very different set of expectations from not just their parents and families, but like in, like in general. Think. And the way that uh, both of our main characters here explore that in such a fascinating way, because it's not like you hit the reader over the head with <laughs> these things. It was just a sort of like a very natural thing that happens when, when you're a teenager and when you're starting to think outside of the family box. Yeah, I mean, it's important. You know, obviously, I'm I'm an adult <laughs> writing young young adult books, and um, you know, I haven't been a high schooler in in many years. So my role is not to talk down to the reader. My role is to pre is to present a story that's rich and exciting and maybe a little scary, and that's it. My I'm, my role is to get the characters to speak, and so anything else is out of my out of my league it's out, mm -hmm. it's out of my hand really um i just want to make sure that the story is as strong as possible you know anything else you get out of it is it's just uh <laughs> i like icing on the cake <laughs> yeah and it is it's a very very good story everything is intentional and everything it's so it is heavy and it is hard at times but read it everyone who's watching just read it when it comes out it, it's just a fantastic a fantastic story and Lillian really made it her own it's not like you you will never get to think of the greek myth outside of like the names in my personal opinion <laughs> <laughs> so thank you <laughs> thank you for writing such an amazing book um so if you were to write another retelling, which one would you like to take a spin on it? I think I've said this before, but um, my favorite book is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And I've read it hundreds of times. Like I read it, I try to read it once a year. And so it's one of my favorite books of all time. And I love the retellings of them. There have been mm -hmm. recent retellings of them that have been great. Like, Kirsten White has a retelling of it. That was a young adult book that just came out uh, recently. And then Victor Laval did a comic book version of it, which, which uh, is called The Destroyer, and it's so good. And so I'm, you know, that if I have to do another, not if I have to, if I want to do another retelling, and that might be it, that might be Frankenstein, some sort of Frankenstein retelling. I don't know what that looks like, but um, I think that might have to do. <laughs> that would be incredible. I love Frankenstein. It's one of my favorite books too. Ooh. It's, it's so good. I yeah. Just, it's my favorites and I'm like I'll have to figure out a way of doing it. I just I don't know what that looks like yet, but yeah. <laughs> I'm already excited about that one and it's not even <laughs> It's <laughs> like not even in my head. Yeah. <laughs> That's so exciting. Um, and would you like to talk about any of your upcoming projects before we finish? No, I am just really focused on getting the book out. Uh, Never Look Back comes out September 1st, mm -hmm. um, 2020. That's only in a couple of months. And um, no, I'm just focused on that. I have deadlines for books, you know, that are that's due. Um, but nothing that I can announce yet. But I'm okay. very excited. Like a couple... Definitely a couple of good books that I think people would really love and enjoy. So I'm excited about those, but I can't say anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so exciting. I am so unbelievably excited about everything that 
you are still you know, putting out. So um, that is it for today's interview. Thank you, Lilian, so much for doing this with Thank me. You. Thank you so much. Here's the book. Yes, remember, it's so pretty. <laughs> the cover is so pretty and the book is incredible. It's amazing. And um, I will leave in the description down below Lilian's links to like her Twitter, Instagram, her website. I will leave links so that you can pre-order Never Look Back. Remember, it comes out on September 1st. And I will also leave the articles that I quoted, sorry, and a couple of more that I thought were also very interesting, also by Lilian, obviously. And <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much, um, Lilian, for doing this with me. And I can't wait for this book to be out in the world and shout about it even more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again for inviting me to do this. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>